Okay, so I'm going to continue with the part two. So what's it, which is part three, by the way. Um, so yeah, let's get to section, um, why is it working? Let's get to section three of the one of part three. Okay, so words often have implicit meanings, like thinking about your team at work and business. Um, you may have words you use in a particular way that only your team members knows. And that is one kind of implicit meanings, right? So sometimes words have, you know, uh, implicit meanings that are not personal or team-based. So some implicit meanings reflect outdated or negative associations. And I call those historical association of archetypes. So an archetype is an historical model of something, an understanding of what something is and how it's supposed to act around people. So archetypes unconsciously tell us who is typically in a role. So they also tell us for whom to use a particular, particular descriptor. So those expectations can unconsciously uh, limit our ability to see who uh, people really are. And let me give you a riddle. Um, the riddle that is often described a hidden archetype in a word. So I want you guys, I want you all to like read this with me, okay? So a father and son were in a car accident, uh, where father was killed. An ambulance brought the son to the hospital. He needed immediate surgery. In an operating room, a doctor came in and looked at the little boy and said, I cannot operate on him. He is my son. So let me ask you a question. Who is the doctor? Okay, so the answer to this riddle is that the doctor is his mother, right? So many people struggle to answer riddle because the archetype hidden in the word doctor, right? So when you think of doctor, do you think of like male doctor or female doctor? Yeah. Right? Most of the time. But there are a lot of female doctors out there. We just, but we still think of like doc, when we associate doctor with male doctor more often. So although medical schools now like are dominated by women, our archetype is historical and we can continue to see doctors as men, even without intending to. So the archetype can limit our ability to see people. Even if we, for example, have women doctor or believe women doctors and man doctor are equally competent. So when unexamined, words with hidden and historical archetypes can limit our ability to see people. So when you use the word doctor, many people automatically see a doctor as a person who identifies as men, right? So in an er emergency, we may mistakenly turn to a man nurse while ignoring the woman doctor. So this can leave a sense of exclusion for those who are not part of the historical archetype. So you may not work in a medical context. So let's do the same exercise of words with broader application, the word genius. Um, um, so on your piece of paper, <laughs> okay, write down one person who is considered genius. 본인이 생각하기엔 그 역사적으로 천재라고 불리는 인물 한번 떠올려 보세요. Okay. Yeah. What, what about you? Einstein. Einstein. Anybody else? What's that name? Ah, that's that's cheating. That's cheating. Huh? Okay, Sejong King Sejong. Okay. Yisun Shin. Okay, the the general Yisun Shin. Yeah. I, I like to hear from uh, um, the you know, female students. <laughs> because every, so okay, 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 good. So like, okay, great. So everybody thought of like male uh, genius most of the time, right? So like on the on the left, so like someone says Einstein, right? So Albert Einstein, like you say, comes to mind, or Edison, or King Sejong, right? 
So few people think of Marie Curie, I mean, except for professors here, professor here, like on the, on the right. You know who Marie Curie, right? All right, anyways. So she she's like the first human being to win two Nobel Prizes, right? So the archetype or genius is a certain kind of man. Do you see what I'm getting here? Right? So the impact is using a word with strong historical archetype can lead you to see not seeing people and excluding them, right? So when like a um, Forbes, you know the met, uh, oh, oops. Okay, um, missing another slide for some reason. Okay, so, you know, there's a magazine called Forbes, right? And when the Forbes like published the first innovative leaders in America list in 2019, they honored 99 men and one woman, right? So archetype of innovative leader is masculine and thus preventing them from like, from seeing women innovative speakers, right? Oh, sorry, innovative leaders. So Forbes magazine did see and include more women innovators in a subsequent list later that year. So here's what's the, the, the key takeaway from this presentation. So archetypes are often hidden in worse meanings can, and that, that can limit your ability to see people, right? And the, many of our archetypes are gendered either about men or about women, a very few of them include a more expansive view of gender, right? And we when consciously use archetypes, uh, they can make they can make people feel excluded, and this dynamic can keep an obscured view of folks based on the past continuing into the present, right? So you may want to think about your own like work, right? So are there any terms that with a strong archetypes that prevent you from seeing everybody? I want you to think about that, oops. All right, so let's talk about next section, which is a words have defaults that can exclude people. So let's talk about standard and defaults. So in engineering, for example, products are often developed with a particular kind of person in mind. So this is like a standard, right? That everybody else must adapt to the standard or engineers might modify the standard for others. That standard is a norm, right? In many instances, like standard is a man, right? So one example is the figures um, used to test car safety. So these figures were designed based on the typical men's height and weight. And um, as a result, women as well as children and smaller uh, men are more likely to sustain injuries from crashes. So this also works in language, right? Words often have hidden, hidden defaults. The defaults signal who is in the group and who is in the outside of the group. So they can be reinforcers of exclusion by signaling who is considered the norm and that everyone else is exception, right? So we may not even notice words have a default until we modify modify them. So let me take you like one example. So when you heard the word, the word couple, right? Couple, we might use a term like, you know, we might use that term couple to mean one man or one woman, one woman. but in the, but there are sometimes LGBTQ couples like, and we might uh, you have one, like two men or two women, right? And we add the qualifier same sex to couple, right? So in doing so, we are unconsciously stating that one man and one woman are the norm and everyone else is the exception, right? So we might not even realize we are using the modifier as norm is embedded in the media, uh, is in like human resource, HR benefits, and many po other po places of authority. So I don't. I, I didn't even know like there was an alternative until I read an article in which the author used the phrases opposite sex couple and same sex couple, and so the words both words have a modifier, and that is like one way to reset expectations. There are no norm. Then there are instead many ways to be a couple, each with its modifier, but using the word only those um, two terms does not include like. Uh, couples where somebody or both are like T, G, and C. So 
to include everybody, to include all, like you can use the term like couple or partners instead of using husband or wife, just use partners um, or being more expansive and use opposite sex, like same sex and TGNC as example, right? So there's no universal formula for you to know what is the most inclusive. So take, uh, for example, the term parent. Uh, in the US, in America, like when you're making like policy, some organizations aim to be inclusive by saying they have parental leave or biological and adoptive, adoptive parents, right? As it turns out, there are more ways than binary to be a parent, right? To be more inclusive, focus on language that includes everyone who is welcoming a child into the family, right? So if you're on, if you're not really sure how to use this language, I recommend like uh, studying, educating yourself. Uh, these word norms change ongoingly. It's like still changing right now. And sometimes it's because like people evolve uh, and sometimes it's that we learn about and try to undo the harm of the norms, right? But when you, you try to educate yourself, I recommend like seeing experts as opposed to starting by asking folks, right? They may not have the energy to educate you, but experts have devoted time uh, to understand the nuance and you can still, um, you know, use that as a starting point of your journey to learn more about that. Okay, so let's talk about the next section. The word choices can create disadvantages in others. Um, so far, I have shared some of the dynamics that can signal un unconsciously belonging or exclusion, right? So now I want to share the distinct types uh, of harm that can come from our word choices, right? So what are the, what are the uh, potential harms? The first is emotional cognitive and even financial burden of folks pay, right? The second is disadvantages, like including like career advancement that can result from our own word choices. So let's go back to the word genius, right? Chunde, to get a sense of disadvantages, right? So when I use the term disadvantages, I mean missing out on opportunity or reward. So if I reuse the word genius, it can limit our ability to see people, right? You may not use words like genius, but in your work, words like intellectual giants, uh, incredible caretaker, or technical genius, when you use words that have a strong archetypes, like you may be giving an advantages to those who aligned with the archetype and disadvantages to, of, to those who do not. So those who do not often have present more evidence to their confidence, even though they're not, they're doing the same work. So your words like uh, may have strong feminine or masculine archetype, right? So consider the word list that I, I shown you before. So, if a meaningful job requires a driven intellectual leader, you are selecting primarily individualistic plays, which are stereotypically masculine, and ignore the traces that are communal, such as supportive, friendly orientation. Like they both are required for success, right? But by focusing on individualistic traits, you are likely creating an implicit advantages to those who are identified as men, right? In addition to disadvantages, words can also cause people to experience burden. So this is a cause for one's well-being. So take the word professional, right? Um, what's professional in Korean, by the way? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right? When you think of do you, do you think of something in your mind right now? So what you might not realize is a term like professional can reinforce exclusionary archetypes that can relate burden for people who do not fit the archetype, right? Uh, so, so the scholar uh, Dr. Sadali Mel Melaku calls this an inclusion text. This is a this is a really inter interesting term. 
So, or the financial, emotional, and cognitive tax a person must pay to fit in, right? So by telling someone they're not acting professional, you may instead by be telling a non-binary person to conform to a gender binary, right? Or by saying a person doesn't look professional, that may be implying that a person of, or of color needs to be straightening their hair to be like white people's hair. So by the, the, one of the researchers named Erica Diego Contreras worked with students and people to understand their burden. So here's a quote by that scholar shared, uh, who shared with me her research study they use in their work. So uh, this is a quote from a Beyonce who is a Mexican American um, lesbian non-binary employee. She's uh, she's uh, that they said. Uh, my job requires justifying the need for LGBT education, convincing them it's in their best interest to be educated about these issues. So they share it with their depart department. So to be effective, um, having is you know having illicit empathy, right? So I share stories about students who struggle and uh, what being marginalized feel like. So I proved a certain level of trauma it can and it has happened for. And faculty and staff and university can see why having education about these issues would help. And I relive my trauma in this position in the session. And even students do it to make the point. You have to be really explicit about the harm it does. So here's something I took away from their words. So if someone has convinced me to learn about their harm in order to change, then I haven't been a good ally, right? In in all honesty, there there have been times when I haven't been proactive and instead had to get pushed into allyship. So I hope by sharing these terms, I can help you find your way to allyship with anybody who does not feel a sense of belonging. And if you join me. Um, you know, surround yourself with folks who give you encouragement to lean into allyship and so on and so forth. So here's a takeaway, right? Here's a lesson. So know any words you may use with a strong archetype or that reinforced binary. So think about the ways you can use a combination of words that is more inclusive. So try substituting a phrase like collaborator who connect people to create new ideas for the term genius, right? Now, this is a lot of sessions. Now I'm giving you strategies on how to use the gender language, right? Or gender inclusive language, that is. There's a lot of sections here. We're almost there. So now um, you now have the framework, right? Uh, to harness the power, to support the power of language to create a sense of belonging in your relationship and on your team and your company, right? The first step is to be intentional and thoughtful in choosing words that have moved beyond a stereotypical and binary words, binary use of words. So here's a framework I have shared with thousands of people. In fact, I, I, I remember a web meeting with a person who had been uh, one of my seminars earlier say, and they wave a paper at me and said, um, you know, I, I still use the list you gave me. And I, that, was, that was really, really mm -hmm. meaningful to me. Okay, so anyways, the list like highlight, list highlighted words typically describe communal or language re uh, and agent, agentic or the language of I, right? This has been like powerful tool for many and I hope it will help you in your own journey and supporting others, right? So why is this list important? Um, because when we rely heavily on words from just one category, we may never unconsciously reinforce the binary way of seeing the world and the others, right? So a person is either a driver or a team player, right? Either thoughtful or outspoken, right? Yet you you likely experience, and as we have 
discussed in this presentation, people are more expansive in, than an either or binary. So here's a strategy. I'm going to give you the strategy you can use. So uh, I want you to use the words um, from both columns. And when you describe an accomplishment, like job requirements or performance evaluation, and or when you introduce someone else or you write your own uh, bio on a like LinkedIn page or Facebook or whatever, this will help you move beyond a binary way of describing people, talents or skills. And this will also help you see more people and they're more likely to feel welcomed by you, right? So here's a list, right? Like communal, like the language of we, right? Mm -hmm. Thoughtful, compassionate, collaborative, uh, agency driven, and also on the on the um on the right, um the language of I, right? Da, right? Uh, confident, influential driver. So, so people sometimes ask me which words to use first. So I think of the idea of anchoring, right? So uh, I'll I'll share the I'll share the list with you later on if you want to. But um, the word that you use first, anchor, the rest of the word in this meaning. So for example, like if I say someone is supportive, like warm and compassionate. Uh, daring, outspoken, or influential. My use of the words um, supportive, warm, compassionate anchors the description and color your sense of the person more strongly than the word that follow, right? So I always suggest like anchoring words for all in a similar way to prevent people from accidentally anchoring differently based on gender, right? And if I am trying to convey authority, I might anchor on agentic words, right? Like, or, um, and if I use, trying to use convey collaboration, I might anchor a communal words, right? So here's the exercise I want you to do. So go back to the list of words you use to describe yourself. Remember the first, in this first time, I asked you to write something about yourself, right? Go back to that list and, uh, and notice if your words are primarily from one of these lists right here. Anybody? Like, I got Togo Singo, Jansa, don't tell me. Yeah. Which cat, like, like, so which category does your words belong? The communal or agentic? We or I? Well, so think about that, right? It really tells about yourself, right? So you should like notice that if your words are primarily from one of the list and, and if it feels authentic to think about like balancing like um, agentic or communal words describe you and write that down and use it when appropriate. So as a bonus exercise, take a look at your you know profile on like Kakao Talk or uh, Facebook or whatever social media profile that you might have and determine a thoughtful and strategic mix of words, right? So if you given an endorsement, like the letter writers I spoke about in the first like first part of the presentation, make sure your advocacy matches your intention. So to strategically use words from the list that empower your endorsement, right? The next section. Now, words have contain words that contain strong gender archetypes or defaults can lead to a sense of exclusion, right? If you want to review this material, um, um, you please go back to the parts where I talk about it in the part three. Um, sometimes a word has an implicit meaning that reflect outdated or negative associations. So I call these like, you know, historical associations archetypes, right? So to be more inclusive, try to move away from archetypes to use more expansive descriptions. Like, you know, instead of like husband or wife, like maybe partner, for example. So archetypes may be difficult to see as an associations are so firmly embedded 
uh, in their con consciousness. So one strategy I use to move beyond the archetype is to stop using the single word to describe a role, person, or value, right? So for example, you know, when I say the word genius, you know, I'm likely to evoke the picture of the particular person identifying as a man, right? Or however, if I say someone who brings people together to spark creativity and champions, support great ideas from everyone, I paint a more nuanced picture in which many can see themselves or be seen, right? So expanding the archetype can be useful in everyday conversations, writing job descriptions, and describing culture. In addition to proactively expanding definitions, you can also catch archetypes um, when you see homogenous lists, right? So remember the list, the innovative uh, list of innovative leaders uh, containing the one woman, 99 men, in the Forbes magazine, right? So former Obama, so so Obama White House Senator uh, Senior Advisor Valerie Jarrett tweeted in response to the list of the Forbes magazine. Um, if your methodology produced only one woman out of hundred most innovative leaders, obviously you should have challenged it rather than publishing it, right? So you can identify words with strong archetype when you pro produce a lopsided list. If this happens, shift your methodology and provide more context. So imagine if the list included innovators who work in the fields of business, uh, who have been like positive, like social impact with their work, right? So that likely will have produced a very different list, right? And you can also um, cast to use uh, defaults by noticing the modifiers. The default signifiers, uh, sorry, default signals um, who is in the group um, and who is in the out group. So there can be reinforcers of exclusion by signaling who is considered the norm and everyone else's exception. So when you notice the use default, try more uh, um, expansive words or removing the modifier. So notice if you see a nurse and a male nurse to describe people in the hospital, this reinforces that the default of nurse is someone who is identified as a woman, right? Then try to say nurse when appropriate. So remember archetypes and defaults can be challenging to catch. They're embedded in everything from media to job descriptions in, a, even, in even our relationships. So give yourself some grace while you're on a journey and know that every time you succeed, you're creating space for others. Almost over. <laughs> this is the last one. So when I think about being inclusive in my word choices, there are one word that supports me in this word, expansive. Like, what's a what's a Korean word for expansive? I I I you got to a a. can could talk. Ah, okay. Talk there, What's up? And you expansive, yeah. So often, like exclusion happens when um when things are narrowly defined. So for, for example, if success is defined as driven go-getter, we may overlook folks who have not stereotypically been associated with that definition. So being more expansive, defining success as both drive and support can help you see more folks. Using an expansive approach can also, uh, also mean noticing words uh, with historical archetypes can leave folks feeling excluded and invisible and trying to expand them. So for example, the word leader can be associated with the archetype man, right? So how do I know? Like for one, when we speak about women, we often use the word modifier woman leader, right? Um, in Korean, you know, when you say actor, and there's also woman actor, peu, yobeu, like something like that, right? It's like, come to, like the word is always associated with men. So now that's a very common word, right? This is uh, even a formal title, title is some organizations. But in common speaking, you could say the folks who are leaving organizations. So think about your another common word, family, right? So in a doctor example that I gave you a uh, few minutes ago, we identify the archetype of doctor as male, right? But 
what the riddle didn't include was a possibility that the child had two dads, right? So I, while I don't have a simple solution for how to be more expansive uh, with the word family, I have practiced with the phrases such as people we call our families, which is also me included, um, where me includes a family where also my second family and so on. This okay, so this brings me to pronouns. Um, you may have noticed that I shared my uh, pronouns he, him, right? Um, when I introduce myself. So naming pronouns makes space for the expansiveness of how people use pronouns. People may use he, him, or they, them, or Ella, El, Ella, but there are also gender neutral and gender inclusive pronouns. So some folks uh, do not use pronouns and may solely use their name. So for me, it, you know, there, there'll be like Laurie, Laurie, or whatever, right? Um, so remember, like, people do not follow a simple pattern. Some people may use multiple pronouns. Some use pronouns that do not match their gender identity, uh, do not make assumption based on someone's pronoun uses. So for me, this means like not putting my understanding ahead of anyone's comforts. Instead, it's about supporting a, for, a, a people as who they are. So then remember, like it may take time to get to know how to use pronouns um, in ways that are different from the ways that you may be socializing to use them. And you make mis you'll make mistakes. There's there's no doubt about that. But when you do, you have to you, all you have to do is just apologize and move on, right? And if you dwell on the mistake, you may turn the attendant uh, attention to you or even require that the person educate you or feel obligated uh, to comfort you. That's more likely to, uh, that's not what you want, but you need to still move on and be support, be supported and practice some more. Okay. I have other slides, but I'm just gonna just end it here. So is it okay? That's, yeah, so this is like, a, um, I, I just like um, included the online resources on how to educate yourself on these type of topics. So yeah, uh, thank you for listening, that's all.